Welcome, everyone. Big announcement, turn off your cell phones, please, please, please. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for coming. We're going to have a wonderful talk. And now Beth is going to introduce our speaker. Walking at last. <laughs> Walking, yes, but not going to stand for the whole thing here. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome back Devin Coleman. You may remember he spoke here just about a year ago on the historic architecture of South Burlington. Uh, Devin is a graduate of Colby College, where he earned his bachelor's in art history. He also holds a master's in historic preservation from the University of Vermont. Since 2006, he has served as the state architectural historian for the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. And in that role, he identifies and documents historic resources throughout Vermont. He also uh, oversees the programs for the National and Vermont Registers of Historic Places. And one of his uh, many interests is modernist architecture. And he's here today to talk to us about modernist architecture in Vermont. So please welcome back Devin Coleman. So is the mic on? Yep. Yeah. Check, check. Is that good? You hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Beth. Good to see you out and about. <laughs> so, so today uh, we'll be talking about mid-century modern uh, architecture in Vermont and specifically houses um, because this is a far greater topic than we can cover in about 45 minutes. So really have to narrow it down. And it's funny because I did my, my thesis at UVM in the Historic Preservation Program on modernist houses in Chittenden County. And even that was almost too big. Um, and when I first started, people would laugh and say like, oh, it's like two houses. Like, <laughs> no, there's a lot out there. Um, but as we'll see, it's just not always as obvious um, to us. But before we uh, dive in, I do want to take a minute and just dedicate this talk to Alice Outwater. Did any of you know Alice? She was, she passed away in December and she was one of the first people uh, I met when I was in graduate school and trying to find these modernist houses. And on the right is a picture of her house on Overlake Drive. and. It's, in hindsight, it was really the perfect embodiment of modernism in Vermont. Because the main house, which is in the, uh, on the left side of the photo, we're looking at the back of the house. The main house was a very traditional Tudor style, 1930s, typical Burlington house. You go in the backyard and it's this floor to ceiling wall of glass, open floor plan, modernist furniture, just, the contrast between the two was so striking, and that's really what a lot of Vermont modernism is. It's not out right in your face. It's kind of behind the more traditional facade of New England, Vermont, uh, but it's there. So you just have to search for it a little bit. Um, so Alice was always very interested in my research and, and really supportive, um, so I just wanted to acknowledge her. So as I said, I came to Vermont in 2004 to study at the UVM graduate uh, program in historic preservation. And we were always being assigned projects, go out, find a building, describe it, analyze it, research it. And I found that I really wasn't interested in researching Greek revival or Victorian or, you know, not that I don't appreciate those styles, but they have been researched to death. You can find any number of books that talk about the styles, the characteristics, the significance. So I really sought out buildings that had not been studied, um, such as this, uh, Macaulay Hall in the Trinity Campus, 1958 building by Marcel Bowden, or Cathedral Church of St. Paul in downtown, uh, 1973 by Burlington Associates, and really looking, trying to figure out why are these buildings here? Why do they look so different from the older styles? Um, and then houses, uh, buildings like the Bar House by J. Henderson Barr in South Burlington. You know, why is this house one story long and flat with walls of glass instead of a big hill section mansion? 
you know, what, was, what was leading to these, uh, these designs. And that brings us to the first question. Uh, you know, we would call this a modern house or a modernist house, uh, their contemporary house. There are a lot of terms that are used interchangeably and loosely, uh, but for our purposes, modernism, uh, capital M modernism, if you will, is really referring to a specific moment in time, late 19th, early 20th century, when there is, at least in the Western world, a wholesale reconsideration of historic traditions. And we see that in things like literature, the work of T.S. Eliot or Virginia Woolf, uh, <clears throat> rethinking how narrative structures are formed and the use of language, uh, modernist artwork, Picasso, the Cubist, George Brock, uh, rethinking how we depict the world in artwork. This leads later on to non-objective art and abstract art. And in music, you know, composers like Igor Stravinsky or Carl Ruggles who are, you know, really rethinking what a work of classical music is and experimenting with atonal compositions and really exploring what the boundaries are, or exploding the boundaries, the traditional boundaries. So it, it was more than just modernist architecture. Modernism was a wholesale movement across many different disciplines, and architecture was one of those. So if we look at architecture, uh, somewhat, uh, it may not seem obvious, but we actually have to go back to the mid-19th century, to the roots of modernist architecture. and. A building that's known as the Crystal Palace, built in London, 1851. And what's amazing about this building is that it enclosed almost a million square feet. Huge structure. <clears throat> and it was all built with uh, cast iron and glass. Incredibly modern in its use of material and structure you can see the framework going up of standardized modular components. This whole thing was built in less than a year because it was all standard. There was no more handcraft, you know, hewing every single log and beam by hand. This was essentially a mass produced building. Later on in, in the late 19th century, uh, 1896, we have architects like Lewis Sullivan in Chicago and his famous uh, credo that form ever follows function. And he was talking about the struggle that architects were having designing skyscrapers because this was a completely new building type. Up until the mid to late 19th century, no one ever needed to build taller than five or six stories. That was the limit of technology. Once we had steel <coughs> and elevators, we could go much taller. But then how do you art articulate that building? So Sullivan's approach was to say that the form of the building follows the function of the building. One of the key uh, tenets of the modernist movement. Then in the 1920s, uh, we have architects. Uh, this is Corbusier in France. And he is really pushing the limits, publishing a magazine called L'Esprit Nouveau. <coughs> Excuse me, get a drink of water here. And in L'Esprit Nouveau, Corbusier really takes a hard line and says, we must divorce architecture from the past. Clean break, we're done with historical styles, we're going to start fresh. And probably the most pivotal moment uh, would be the founding of the Bauhaus School in Germany. And this is a school of design headed by Walter Gropius, a German architect. And what was really groundbreaking about this school is that it was not just an architecture school, it was a fine arts school and a craft school. And while they were looking at really promoting modernist design, they were also teaching traditional crafts of weaving and silversmithing and you know handicrafts. 
but in a very modernist aesthetic, so that the rugs that were being made were not floral pattern oriental rugs. They were very bold geometric designs that could fit right into buildings like this. So a very strong interaction of uh, an integration of modernist architecture and the arts and crafts. So <clears throat> you'll notice we've had France, Germany. This is all happening in Western Europe, early 20th century. Why? Well, if you lived through World War I in Germany, in France, in Europe, the utter devastation, destruction, the massive social upheaval radically changed everyone's view of the past. Because what had come before led to this. So maybe the past wasn't what they wanted to emulate. And this was really a turning point for a lot of architects and designers who said, we can either keep designing in traditional modes the way they did through the 19th century, or this is our chance. Blank slate, start fresh, and create a new, uh, a new ideal, uh, almost a utopian world. And that's embodied in buildings like uh, Mies van der Rohe's uh, apartments in Germany, where you have just very pure, regular form, <clears throat> no decoration. You know, there's a saying, a German architect Adolf Luce, who proclaimed that ornament is a crime. You know, <laughs> that was, <laughs> might be going a little far. Um, but as with anything, there, you know, there's a broad spectrum. None of this is set in stone. It's, it, it develops, and some are more adamant than others. So this is happening in Europe, and World War I was kind of the genesis of this. And then the next key turning point was World War II, when a lot of these architects in Germany and France come to the United States. And one of the first inklings that we see in Vermont is this house in South Burlington, Pizzigalli House. And this is, as far as I've found, the first international style house in Vermont. And it's early. I mean, 39. This was cutting edge. This was really right in, in the thick of it. This house was published in the, the free press uh, in 1936. It was an experimental house. And uh, somehow, uh, Pizzigalli got a hold of the plans and was able to recreate it. He was a mason, so he could build a cement house very easily. And he was also from Switzerland. So this is a very European modernist house. It must have uh, appealed to his sensibilities. And this is how the house looked. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that picture's from the mid 80s. It's still there. Uh, it's near the airport. Um, it's been slightly altered, but the, the overall form is, is still intact. At the same time, uh, we have uh, local architect Lewis Newton, who's designing, uh, you know, he was sort of a jack of all trades. You, you name it, he could design in that style. And this is a, a design he did for a developer. And I love that it's labeled at the bottom as the quote, modern house. <laughs> um, this, was, this was pretty edgy <laughs> for Burlington, Vermont in 1939. And this was, he did, I think, six house plans, four of which were built. This one was not built. Um, the most modern one is this one. This is on Locust Street. It's still there today. And just on the left edge, you can see another house with a Dutch gable roof. He, he sort of did a, a Dutch colonial, a, a New England colonial, and then more traditional house. And then this was the modern one. And in it, we can see kind of a, a Vermont interpretation of the modernist aesthetic. It's very stripped down. There's no decorative shingle work. There's no extra trim. There's not a big fancy cornice with dentils. And uh, it's, it's very cubic in form. Everything's very linear, horizontal. Uh, so this is kind of the, the distillation of those modernist ideas in Europe coming to Vermont. A 
Another building uh, of note is the Freeman House. This was built in 1941. It's on DeForest Road in Burlington. And this was actually the home of uh, Bill and Ruth Freeman, uh, who were partners with John French of the Freeman French Freeman architecture firm. And when this was built in 41, uh, the free press really didn't know what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> other than unusual. <laughs> so um, I, I love that because it shows just how, what is this? <laughs> was the, kind of the, the thinking in, uh, in Burlington at the time. You know, in the article starts, a distinct departure from the conventional style of architecture. You know, this, this was a big deal. It was called a chicken coop and, you know, it was, um, but this is really embodying the form following the function. You know, the, the form of their house, they wanted a very simple, easy to maintain house made with local materials, but in a modern form. It's a beautiful setting, yes. <laughs> it's built on, onto a rocky outcropping. In fact, the back half of the lower level is all ledge. It's literally built right on the rock. Um, but this house, undoubtedly has its roots in this house. In, this is not in Vermont. Oh, I wish it was. Um, this is the Gropius house. Remember we talked about Gropius as the founder of the Bauhaus? So he moves to the United States to teach at Harvard in 1938. And at the same time, he builds, designs and builds this house in Lincoln, Massachusetts. And this was groundbreaking. This published internationally because what Gropius was doing was bringing the theory of European modernism and transplanting it to New England. So that, while it is a very bold geometric form, it has a vertical board wood siding. So it's not a pure, you know, white stucco finish like they were doing in Europe. It's wood siding. That's a New England material. Uh, on the back of the house, which we can't see in this picture, uh, Part of it is red brick. There's a low stone wall, like a traditional New England field stone wall around the back garden. So he was really working on trying to not just drop a modernist box <laughs> in the New England landscape, but really integrate it through the materials to a New England ver vernacular. And I do want to note that because this is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Bauhaus, uh, Historic New England, which owns the Gropius House, is doing a lot of programming this year about modernism in New England. And this is their most recent magazine with a picture of Walter Gropius. Um, I definitely, if you're ever in the Lincoln area, go to Gropius House. It's well worth it. So back in Vermont, uh, here's John French, Ruth Freeman, and Bill Freeman. And they were really the leading practitioners, at least in, in northern Vermont, of modernism. And you can tell by the house they built, they were not ashamed of it. That house was really kind of their calling card, I think. It's very obvious. If you were thinking of hiring the Freemans to design a house for you and saw their house, you kind of knew what you were <laughs> getting into. Uh, you didn't necessarily go to them for a colonial revival, although they did that. In, during the Depression, they did a lot of colonial revival because they had to pay the bills. But once they were back on their feet, um, they were very uh, innovative. And Ruth Freeman was actually the lead designer in the firm, which is, which is very interesting for a, a female at this time to be uh, des lead designer. And some of her projects, uh, this was a, a design for a house that was not built. It was published in a book. Uh, I think uh, Libby Owens Ford uh, Corporation commissioned an architect in every state to design a solar house. This is 1946. Wow. So we think we're pretty hot shot with our solar panels today. <laughs> it's, you know, they were thinking about this and. Ruth's, Ruth Freeman's design takes into account siding. The house is facing south. Lots of windows. Uh, very low roof overhang so that in the winter when the sun is low in the sky, the sunlight can come in. Um, so very, very thoughtful designs and innovative designs trying to uh, maximize, you know, this is really 
green design, what we would call today, they were doing in the 40s. Another key piece in Vermont is the marketing and development of Vermont as a vacation destination. And that does, has to do a lot with the growth of the ski industries and second homes, the post-World War II baby boom and the economic uh, rise and suddenly people had disposable income, they had cars, they could go to the mountains, they could drive up from Boston, New York, Connecticut and spend a weekend in Vermont. And gradually some of those people said, wouldn't it be nice to own a little house in Vermont? And so a lot of architects uh, were designing simple, you know, summer cottages and camps in a modern style. This is one by Julian Goodrich. And, uh, you know, this was a, a really important market for these architects to be able to try out these ideas on, you know, a second home, you might be a little more willing to be a little more experimental. You know, you have your nice traditional home and uh, New York, you go to Vermont, that's where you have the funky A-frame ski chalet or the, you know, the wacky modernist place. So that was really important. And that's part of why these buildings can be so hard to find because they might be up at the end of a dirt road on a mountain in Stowe. Or they might be, you know, on the shore of Lake Champlain where you can only see it from the water. So trying to tease out where these buildings are has been part of the fun. That, unfortunately, no, it was not built. In fact, I tracked down the son of Dr. John about Abajian, and the son had no idea that this had ever been considered. <laughs> so he was like, oh, why didn't they build it? <laughs> so. so also uh, at this time, we start to see the, the development of uh, much smaller compact houses. And this is all coming from Frank Lloyd Wright. I can't give a lecture without mentioning Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he was so influential. And this is a house by Julian Goodrich, a local architect, and it's on Spear Street, 1947. So post-World War II, Julian needed a, a small house for his family, and he went to the bank with a flat-roofed design. The bank said, nope. We will not give you a loan for a flat roofed house. So I went back to the drawing board, came up with this. And it's really a, a beautiful little house. This is the back elevation. And you'll see that, you know, the street view is pretty closed. It, it's not a super welcoming. <laughs> you know, there's no big broad front porch. Um, and this was a shift in the, the social uh, ideas of what a house was and that you didn't want everything on display to your neighbors necessarily. It was make the back of the house open up into the landscape. And we can see in the floor plan here, this is a very simple plan. Combined living dining room, two bedrooms, shared bath, kitchen and breakfast room together, and then a bunch of closets. Uh, a lot of built-ins, and this was really about economy, and Frank Lloyd Wright and his uh, designs for what he called the Usonian house, which was supposed to be an affordable, small, but well-designed house for the average American. Uh, on grade, no basement, no attic, uh, typically no garage, because that would just collect stuff, um, maybe a carport, um, but really just trying to distill the essence of a house down to the, uh, you know, the form follows the function. You're living in this house, do you need all that extra stuff? Uh, it's a great house, I don't know if I could live there, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's really, even, even the wall system, there's solid plank walls, sheathing boards and then siding inside and out. No air cavity, no space, nowhere to run wires. Um, <laughs> so. Really, a lot of experimentation going on at this time. And I, I happened to uh, talk with Julian about this house before he passed away. And that wall detail, he said, oh, I stole that from Frank. Like, you know, <laughs> Lloyd Wright. <laughs> so what I love about this house is that this is on Spear Street in South Burlington. And it's published nationally in Better Homes and Gardens. 
so little old Vermont, <laughs> you know, things are happening here with design that are getting national exposure. And Better Homes and Gardens uh, would do a monthly, uh, for a while it was the five star home of the month or the uh, you know, house, house of the month. And they chose uh, this house by Julian and published photos, a description, and a floor plan, and then you can send in your $5 and get a set of blueprints and build your own. So these might be all over the country, who knows? But you know, the cover of another issue of Better Homes and Gardens shows kind of the classic, this is the 1959 idea home issue. And you can see the types of houses that were being promoted. One story, you know, easy to build, economical, not a lot of decoration, uh, but not the austere modernist white box. You know, there, there's a little more, a uh, little more life to these, a little more New England character, if you will. You know, it's not a stretch to, you know, maybe say this is a basic, you know, Cape Cod house form, with a bank of windows in the end and a little covered uh, carport and garage. You know, so it's it's picking up on traditional New England. Uh, building forms, but tweaking it for modern life. And floor plans, definitely, it's not just about the exterior look of the building, it's how the spaces relate. So you, none of these houses have maids rooms. <laughs> the maid <laughs> was gone. Uh, most likely an open floor plan, combined living, dining room, uh, a kitchen that might open up into a breakfast nook. So. The disintegration of the, in, the, the boxes within a box concept of what a house is. Um, so you have very open, flowing floor plans. Another one of my favorites, this is the Flick House, uh, 1953 in Randolph. And, you know, just almost like an airplane wing. Just, <laughs> it just I love the, the sighting. It's right at, it, not, not right at the crest of the hill, it's kind of built into the hill, and that was another Frank Lloyd Wright um, approach, is you don't build on top of the hill, you build with the landscape, sort of nestle it in. And this house also, very experimental, published nationally in House Beautiful. And uh, Miriam Flick, the architect, actually got uh, a bunch of corporate sponsors to provide new materials, so it has, uh, fancy foil-faced insulation and double glazed windows and uh, in-floor radiant heating, all these things that we take for granted today, but we're cutting edge at this time and supposed to, you know, 47 ways to lick a tough winter climate. So, you know, using Vermont as the, the showpiece and this house is still there today. It has been added onto, but the overall concept um, is still very much intact. And the illustration you can see uh, all of the, the structure of the house is exposed. All the, the ceiling beams, the framing of the windows. So again, that's the form following the function. You know, you, you don't need to cover that up. You know, let the structure express how is the ceiling held up? Well, there are the beams. So it becomes, in the, and then in, as a result, that structure becomes, in a way, the decoration. You don't need to add more stuff to it. Lots of decorative trim and crown molding that is uh, the decoration. Vermont Life Magazine, uh, you know, it's interesting if, if you go back in the early issues of Vermont Life Magazine, it was not about old timey Vermont. It was really about 1950s Vermont and showing how Vermont is kind of keeping up with the times. And this article, you know, new houses in Vermont Every house is a modernist design. Uh, the Burt House and Stowe, uh, both of these are by Dan Kiley. Grenfell House out in Charlotte. So, you know, this is Vermont. Vermont life was a marketing tool. And a very conscious decision to do articles about how Vermont is modern and progressive, not how Vermont is, you know, horse and buggy. You know, they, they really wanted to show Vermont as, as uh, looking to the future. Another house featured in the article is the Pennington Hale House in Norwich by E.H. and M.K. Hunter, architects from Dartmouth. 
And you know, this is really, uh, really getting into the more academic modernism and uh, what you would expect in, in Norwich, proximity to Dartmouth College. A lot of amazing modernist houses in Norwich that are being researched and documented right now. Um, sadly, this has been torn down, replaced with a big three-story McMansion thing. Um, you know, <laughs> modernized. <laughs> so, but again, we see the traditional, uh, you know, a little more uh, adventurous form. But again, it's got vertical board, uh, wood siding, so it's still working in a, a New England materials mode, a brick base. Um, so trying to make it fit with the landscape. And then probably the closest thing Vermont has to a Frank Lloyd Wright house. <coughs> uh, this is the Coyle House uh, in Burlington on Fairmount Street. And really a, a perfect study of a Frank Lloyd Wright Usonian house in its one story, slab on grade, very simple design, a carport, not a full garage, and closed, completely closed off to the street. Um, the front door is actually tucked behind a masonry mass here, so the door is entered here. So you, even just driving by, you don't necessarily see, how do you get in there? Very private. But then on the back, it's a whole wall of floor-to-ceiling French doors that open up into a beautiful backyard. So again, it's that, that shift in the family dynamic, the social dynamic, where you know, you're, you're private to the street, but you're open in the backyard. And this house is still there today. It's, other than the carport being filled in as a garage, um, it's pretty much intact. I also want to point out that these ideas were not just for new construction. Uh, there were certainly architects uh, who took existing Vermont farmhouses. You know, this pretty ramshackle, <laughs> classic, you know, mid 19th century farmhouse out in Underhill, and it was uh, converted into a very sharp, modern. Uh, interpretation of a New England farmhouse. And this was uh, Bill Linda who did this, a local architect. And you know, really it, it's about enlarging the windows, new siding, putting some roof dormers on. And this too is published nationally as an example of how to take an existing home and modernize it. And they also, on the interior, they broke up all the little independent uh, compartments of rooms and made a more free-flowing open floor plan. This house is in Shelburne, the Hubbard House, uh, Charlie Hubbard. Um, certainly one of the most unique building forms, uh, the circular shape, it's beautiful, it's still there, it's still in the family, um, very well maintained and taken care of. But again, expressing the sense of experimentation that was available uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, where there, there was a real interest and willingness to try something new, try a new material, try a new building form, and see, see what you can do. And one of my favorites, uh, Jim Hill, uh, lived on East Terrace in South Burlington. And this is partly because of this picture, it's just Classic. The architect sitting in his Eames fiberglass shell chair with his globe lights in the background and the wall of glass. Like, this is 1960s architecture, right here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the house that Jim Hill built for himself and his family on East Terrace. Again, long and low, very gently, slightly pitched roof, uh, exposed framework. A wall of clear story windows along the top of the walls, vertical board siding, still that New England tradition. And to show just how still, this is 1967, so modernism has been around for a couple decades now, but this is, this is what it looked like. <laughs> Literally cows grazing in the backyard of this modernist house. So 
just and especially the car. You know, to me, the car looks old-fashioned. The house does not. You know, this house could be built today, and it would be a contemporary modern house. Um, so it, it's all in you know your perspective of things. But I, I love this with the elm trees running in the background. That's Williston Road. Uh, the cows, the elm trees, and then this modern house. And into the 70s, uh, again, new forms are being experimented uh, and tried out. Uh, we start seeing what's known as the shed style. You can figure out why. Um, and this, uh, even more so than uh, probably the Gropius house, I mean, this is taking the classic Vermont barn, that steeply pitched 1212 pitch roof breaking it up and rearranging the pieces and making a new form. So this is really um, linking directly with New England and Vermont traditions. And the vertical board siding, very natural, landscaped. And you know the headline here, oh, just off the screen, it says, happy symbiosis of ageless hills and modern house in Heinsberg. And I think that sums it up really nicely, because in Vermont, modernism is human scale. It is not New York City or Chicago with skyscrapers that are just blank walls of glass. You know, that's another side of modernism <laughs> that's not great. Um, but I think in Vermont, it's really a human scale modernism and something that people can uh, appreciate and interact with and uh, can be a quite, make for a quite wonderful house. I also want to note that modernism wasn't limited to architecture. It's also landscape architecture. And uh, in Vermont, uh, Dan Kiley, probably the foremost modernist landscape architecture of the 20th century, lived in Charlotte, Vermont. Worked for 50 plus years out of Charlotte. Uh, not a whole lot of projects in Vermont, but uh, a few. Uh, Courier Farm in Danby, where he's taken the traditional uh, apple trees, grove of apple trees, but laid them out on a very strict geometric grid, long, low, horizontal steps, but again, with a natural field stone wall on each side. So integrating that very pure, clean modernism with the more, uh, the rougher New England countryside. And in Burlington, uh, Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in the news because it's for sale. Uh, that landscape of 123 locust trees is a Kylie landscape, the only one in Burlington. And we're kind of worried about what's going to happen to that uh, because it's, it's the type of landscape and, and the building, uh, which is a great modernist church. They look simple. That doesn't mean that they were easy. There's a big difference between easy and simple. <laughs> it, it's actually really, really hard to design a building that's just a handful, you know, wood siding, glass, and a flat roof. That's much harder to design a good building than if you have three stories and a porch and turn columns and gingerbread details and shingle work and five different colors. You know, you can hide a lot of stuff with all that trim. To do a really good modernist building and distill it down to the elements is really difficult. And I think that's why Kylie's landscapes with their geometry, they look easy to do. It's like, well, I can plant trees in a grid, but it's not that, <laughs> it's not that easy to make it successful. So we're, we're not sure what's going to happen with the cathedral property. If anybody wants to buy it and save it, talk to me. Um, if you want to know more about Dan Kiley, I do want to put a plug in for an exhibit coming up uh, this summer at the Henry Sheldon Museum in Middlebury. It's a national traveling exhibit of Kiley's work, and it's finally coming to Vermont. It should have premiered here, but <laughs> we're, we're finally getting it, and it should be really great. We have a lot of programming uh, lined up with landscape architects and photographers talking about the exhibit. Um, so certainly check the Henry Sheldon Museum website uh, for more information if you're interested in that. And with that, I will uh, finish up, and thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Yes. After a winter like we've had now, snow on these flat roofs. Yes. Is that form following function? It's, it's not always perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and there are absolutely cases where the, the design that the architects came up with far exceeded the skills of the local builders. You know, how a flat roof can work perfectly well in a northern climate if it's done right. And if, you, if you've never done a flat roof and you, you know, do the best you can and it's not detailed right, it's going to leak. So a flat roof is not as forgiving as a gable roof. Um, but with, certainly with today's modern membrane roofs, you can do a flat roof. Um, actually, very few of the houses that I studied uh, for my thesis actually have a totally flat roof. Most have a very slight pitch or they uh, drain to the center. Uh, to a central drain pipe. Um, but that certainly was an issue. <laughs> I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright's houses are famous for leaking roofs, and he said, well, that's how you know that it, you know, you have a roof. <laughs> so. Any other? Yes. Oh. Where on Spear Street is that house that you showed? right across from Gutterson Field House. Oh. And there's an amazing picture from that, uh, a series that Julian Goodrich had looking out the kitchen windows towards what is now Gutterson and the parking garage and everything, and it's just open grassland. <laughs> um, and that house is a little hard to see because it does have a two-car garage built in front of the right side of it. Um, but if you drive down there and take a look, it would be on the east side of Spear Street. When it was built about 75 years ago, St. Mark's was sort of on the edge, St. Mark's Church. Can you say anything about that? Yeah. So St. Mark's Catholic Church in the New North End on North Avenue. Uh, groundbreaking design. I think that was built in 41 by Freeman French Freeman. And you know, right on, I don't actually know how they got materials for it, because it's right on the eve of, of World War II. Uh, and it was built through 1942. And really a groundbreaking design in that it was one of the very first modernist churches in the country. It was written up in the New York Times uh. as, and the, the headline in the New York Times says something to the effect that, who would have thought that one of the most groundbreaking church designs is in Burlington, Vermont? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And, I'm not sure if it's just because it was Burlington and the diocese said, do it, <laughs> or, you know, it's, uh, but it's really remarkable. If you have a chance, drive up North Avenue um, and it will be on your left and it's a cruciform shape. The interior is very pure, you know, some people say it's plain and cold. It's red brick, you know, it's that classic New England material, oak pews, stone altar, just very elemental, very pure, uh, beautiful building. Oh, right here. Thanks for the great talk. Um, yeah. What's the state of hi historic preservation on any of these buildings? Are they any of them landmarked or preserved um, in yes. some way? Yeah, we're making progress. Um, I mentioned that Norwich has a good collection of modernist houses, and about two years ago, they did a whole National Register Historic District of modernist houses. And they're now working on listing some individual examples around the community. Uh, other examples, you know, it's, it's getting, a lot of these buildings are in institutional settings, you know, UVM, uh, Bennington College has an incredible collection of modernist buildings and they know, <laughs> so that's good. They understand what they have. Anyone here from UVM? UVM's a little more dicey. <laughs> But we're trying, you know, it's, it's about education. You know, for, for a lot of people, a historic building in their mind is something that looks old that my grandma lived in. You know, and the, that's not what these are. <laughs> so, so 
So it takes education and, and some, uh, some convincing sometimes uh, to, to explain why these are significant as well. Where's the, whoa, where's that roundhouse in Shelburne? It is, uh, I don't know the street names because I drive them so often. <laughs> it's, it's, it's off of Spear, it's between Spear and Seven. Um, is it French Hill? Irish Hill. I Irish Hill, that's it, yeah. It's on, just off of, you can't see it from the road. No. Uh, if you go to Google, Aerial, <laughs> you can see it. Um, but yeah, really an interesting design. Question here? Can you talk a little bit about the design and the materials used in the interiors of some of these sure. homes? Sure, yeah, good question. Um, like the exterior with experimental materials, uh, interiors also were using uh, things like uh, cork flooring, uh, linoleum, real linoleum, not sheet vinyl, real linoleum <laughs> flooring, um, metal kitchen cabinets, that was a big thing in the 50s. Um, and there were, in fact, the house I live in had a full GE kitchen of the stainless steel wall ovens, metal cabinets, um, and it's still there. That's literally why I bought the house. <laughs> um, and, but interiors, wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting, that was a big deal. No more cold hardwood floors, no wall-to-wall yeah. -wall carpeting, because it was new. You know? Of course, we bought our house and ripped out the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and put hardwood floors in, <laughs> so it's, it's all cyclical. Um, but you know, with those huge windows, picture windows, a lot of draperies, you know, heavy window treatments were very popular. Um, you know, depending on the house. In some cases, if somebody had a really minimalist aesthetic, they might just have you know, uh, Venetian blinds in the windows, but others might have uh, more decorative drapes. Um, so a pretty wide variety of, of treatments, things like formica, uh, that was a new material for countertops, um, and color, you know, a lot of, especially into the 70s, the harvest gold and the, you know, avocado green. Yeah. <coughs> um, trust me, it'll come back. <laughs> We're, we're almost there. <laughs> so. But yeah, and with, with interiors, the final piece is really the materials as well as the overall floor plan. Just totally changing the whole dynamic of how, you know, the basement rumpus room for the kids. It was a new thing in the 50s. So. Hi. Yes. Um, I'll talk about one of your failures. <laughs> Burlington High School. Yeah. <clears throat> Burlington High School, that's a tough one. <laughs> I do not understand why they built it where they did for the first thing. It's an incredibly challenging site because it's a rock hillside. <laughs> so Freeman, French Freeman did the building and their solution is actually pretty elegant given the site because they couldn't build a single one-story building you know, if they built on a flat ground where the running track is, they could have done a, a much more functional building. But with that sloped site on bedrock, they had to break it down into individual components that kind of step up the hillside and then are connected by skyways. It, it's just not, it served its purpose, <laughs> let's put it that way. It will be replaced and that's one that I reviewed to look at, is this a historic building and we decided it's, there's really nothing that special about it. You know, and, and that's an important thing to understand is that not everything old is historic. So I'm certainly not saying that everything built 50 years ago or older is historic. You know, that's when we, one will evaluate it and see. And in the case of the high school, it's concrete block, glass walls, flat roofs, and that's about it. You know, drop ceilings. <laughs> it's, there's nothing there to really latch onto as a really significant design feature or aesthetic. It certainly didn't lead to other examples of building in that mode. So that was a tough one. And you know, it's also important to remember that these buildings were built before uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, there are parts of Burlington High School that somebody in a wheelchair 
you literally cannot get there. Yep. Even if you go outdoors and around and up a ramp and down, a, you cannot get there. That wasn't a factor in the design of these buildings. Same with you know, energy efficiency. A lot of people dismiss modernist buildings because, oh, they leak heat and they, you know, those walls of glass are impractical. That was not an issue in the 50s. Nobody thought about their heating bill. It was just, it was easy. Um, and it, our environmental consciousness, which is absolutely essential today, um, but it's, it's important not to dismiss these buildings because they don't meet today's standards. They can be upgraded. You, know, you can put in double glazed, triple glazed windows, insulate the roof, um, and keep the overall, de overall design intact while improving the efficiency. Yes? I'm curious where the Heinsberg house is, the one with the shed roofs. I don't know. I have not seen that one. I think that was one that Tom Collins designed, of Collins Truex. Um, Maybe for the Ross family, but I don't know for sure. That, that's one, trust me, I've got a whole list of places I need to track down, <laughs> so. I have a question. Um, when I was growing up in Burlington, my parents had an 1840s house in Lincoln and a tech-built house in Burlington uh, on Prospect Parkway. I know your house. <laughs> and a wonderful house. Was it before the, one at the, the garage? At the top of the hill or the bottom of the, the hill? The bottom of the hill. Okay. With the dip in the back yep. that goes down to the stream, so yep. it was totally private mm -hmm. and all glass yep. on that side. My mom always complained that they used cheap materials or the cheapest materials hmm. when they built those houses and that they a lot of it didn't stand up. Hmm. Could you comment on that? I I'm a little surprised because tech built was um, what I term a pre-engineered house. It, it wasn't a prefab where it arrived on site on a truck and they plopped it on the ground, nor was it a pre-cut like a Sears kit house where you got a railroad car of two by fours and put it together yourself. It was a panelized wall system where uh, the walls and floor plates and roof panels were all made in a factory, shipped to the site and then bolted together and put um, assembled on on the property. And generally, they, my understanding is they're, they're pretty good. I mean, there are two in that, what's that? No closets, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Open floor plan. <laughs> um, but a lot of light, very modern, and th that was the architect of those was Carl Koch, and he was really dedicated to trying to make modernism affordable. Because what happened is so many of these buildings uh, became just for the elite. And Carl Koch and others really wanted to design an affordable, modernist house that could be built you know, for a typical family. Two kids, two adults, and that's what the tech built was. Um, again, no attic, no basement. Um, so trying to, cutting out the extra stuff to get the price down, that was a real um, motivating factor in those houses. I live couple doors away from there. <laughs> yes. Why is it that that um, immaculate conception that's for sale not um, being involved in being a protected ha or protected structure because of the preservation? You can't get is it because it's in flux, it's not an owner? Or? Um, well, it's, it's the way preservation laws are set up in the United States. <laughs> in, in America, preservation is not, uh, buildings are not designated and landmarked the way they are in Europe. In the US, it's really, the owner has a lot of control and the owner can say, no thank you. We don't want to be landmarked. In Europe, that designation can be applied against over owner objection to say that's an important site, you will protect it. We don't do that in America. Um, so it's, it's tough to, where, where the regulations do come into play is if a project is involving, put my work hat on, state or federal funding licenses or permits. <laughs> so it's, if there's public money involved in a project and a historic resources involved, 
then it goes on through review. But if the Catholic diocese were to sell that property to a private developer using their own funds, getting their local permits, they can really do what they want, tear it down. Uh, yeah. So the, the, you know, the process of listing a property in the, in the state or national register in and of itself does not protect a property. That's a big misperception that people have. Um, it helps inform, you know, it's part of the education it's so that hopefully somebody will read that information and think twice before tearing it down. But at the end of the day, there's not always uh, much that can be done. Great. Anyone else? Thank you very much.